who should be live. Do you see something that says live? Yes. You should say hello. Yes. Hello, OAC. Hello, hello. <laughs> Hi, OAC. I'm so sorry we're late. It is my fault. Again, technical difficulties. My name is Karen Boyty, and I am a member of the Board of Directors of the Ontario Autism Coalition. And from time to time, we host Facebook Lives. These chats are an attempt, just an attempt, to expand upon the discussions that we have on our Facebook page. And tonight, my victims are Teresa Armstrong, Monique Taylor, and Angela Brandt. This is our theme. What's the best way to raise issues surrounding the politics of autism with the NDP, the New Democratic Party? We Ontarians are very proud of our universal health care and proud of our education system, but somewhere along the line, something stops. Universality doesn't apply when it comes to autistic children and adults. The OAC encourages parents to meet with their MPPs, members of provincial parliament, often, and we try and we have had a proven track record with protesting things that we don't like, but how can we also speak with opposition members who hope to be the decision makers one day? Hi, gals. Hi. Good evening. Thank you for your time. Nice I will post both. your very extensive bios at the end of this chat. So quickly, we'll give the uh, community some context here. Angela Brandt. Hi, Angela. She Hello. The president of the Ontario Ontario of the Ontario Autism Coalition, and she is a statistician by training. She's one smart cookie. I'll be relying heavily on her expertise for this discussion. Teresa Armstrong. Hi, Teresa. Hi, everyone. Nice Welcome. to meet you all. Thank Welcome. you for having me. Teresa is the new, is it okay if I call you Teresa? Teresa. Absolutely. Okay. All right. <laughs> she is the newly appointed critic for children and youth services as the end in, in, as a member of parliament for the NDP. And she has replaced Monique Taylor, who is moving on to champion people in the mental health community. Hi, Monique. Hi, Karen. Nice to see you. Welcome back. Happy Welcome back. <laughs> Many in the OAC have related strongly to Monique's robust ability to speak truth to power, and she personified the passions of many parents who fight for their autistic children. So we, before we uh, let you go completely, Monique, I want to take part of this hour and allow for some reflection on your part, if you're willing to share, and the manner in which you've helped Teresa step into our world. Does that sound like a plan? Sure. So okay. you so I'm just gonna do a little bit of clicking here so I can see you all. All right, now I can see you. <laughs> okay. First question for the, this evening's for Teresa. Teresa, you've come to the autism file by way of being the critic for long-term care. And I noticed that in your past, you were also an insurance broker. Has this background helped with your learning curve concerning therapeutic services for autistic people in Ontario? So I will always be an insurance broker at heart. And what I mean by that <laughs> is that we always look how to mitigate risk. So there's not a catastrophe or a, you know, a claim. So I take that approach in when I, do, uh, when I work in politics. How do I uh, do proactive um, actions in order to mitigate a crisis, right? And so as a guiding principle in all the work that I've been uh, exposed to, I believe that every person has a right to a decent life and that our system that's in place right now is not working to protect our most vulnerable. And I, I, I look at that parallel with long-term care, right? I've learned um, in long-term care to listen to the experts and families who have lived experience and for them to lead the way in how we work as elected officials and represent them and, their, and what their needs are. And so that's why I've approached this portfolio as well is that 
you know, all the groups that I've met, and especially the Ontario Autism Coalition, um, you guys have informed me, and you have shown in the past, along with Monique, so I really, um, you know, appreciate what Monique, the work she's done on the file, and I continue to consult with Monique as well, um, about holding this government accountable, and that looks so different right now, um, because we have COVID happening, it's, it's a little, um, environment's a lot different in the legislature, where we can, show that real passion and I'm going to say um, anger or frustration uh, towards the government because you know we've got COVID happening people are you know they're dying there's people in the ICUs and it's difficult to um, use the passion that we want to use in a way so that it, it comes across that you're not um, you're not, you're not dismissing the seriousness of COVID, but we need to understand that, you know, the autism file is just as serious. And every time we do, we either heckle or say something uh, that's a little bit like jab to the government, you get called out of order by the speaker. He puts you, you know, member from, you know, London Fanshawe, come to order. You know, it, it, there's literally no wiggle room to heckle or to, uh, you know, make a statement that's going to spark the government to get off their, you know, get on their feet and, and fight back, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Isn't, uh, sorry, Karen, isn't yeah. heckling like a, a tradition uh, in Queen's Park? It used to be. <laughs> it used to be very much, yeah, it used to be very much, you know, that sparring back and forth. Um, but with this government, right from the get-go, everything that, anything would be very sensitive. You touch a nerve, and um, they just reacted in a, in, a, in a way like this member is being disrespectful. It's not parliamentary. We're like, well, you know, we're calling you out, right? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, so I felt mm -hmm. for me early on, I, I don't know about Monique, but I felt early on the tone was they dictate what happens, the behavior. And if they don't like the behavior, they're going to shut it down yeah. uh, either by changing the standing orders or either by, you know, um, uh, you know, shaming you into not doing it, uh, you know, how dare you, how dare you, fact, it's not what you're saying, let's stick to the facts. Well, there's, you know, it's, it's literally a belittling, right? So um, at, when that, COVID, and that was early on, and now once COVID uh, came, it, the demeanor has changed because of the, you know, the environment we're in, and the speaker is very much stringent on any heckling, any outburst, uh, you know, comments when someone else is speaking, calling them out. So yeah. that all started pretty much with COVID. No, the, it started the, when the started pandemic. before COVID. Absolutely. Yeah. They wanted to keep a tight lid on everything. Yes. Um, this government did not want you to, you know, speak out against or backlash. They wanted to get their message out and that was it. And any, like I say, any little bit of uh, creative way of asking the question and it's, you know, a prodding, you would be, it's unparliamentary, a point of order, uh, you know, a, that language is unparliamentary, point of order, you know, it's, it's literally, that's how uh, ridiculous mm -hmm. it got. That, that's interesting, because Angela has spent a lot of time at Queen's Park, maybe not mm -hmm. quite so much as the two of you, but she lived there for a good six months, I think. What, what's the demeanor of the provincial, of the government side? If they're cracking down on the opposition, what is their demeanor, Angela? Well, while I was there, they were extremely disrespectful, um, condescending, and uh, dismissive. So, you know, I guess what's goose, what's good for the goose, is not necessarily what's good for the gander. Mm -hmm. Monique has was famously, you know, you're a bit uppity there, Monique. Uh, and I, I should have had some video. Out, I should have brought some video. I should have had a bit ready to show the show the community. But you've been tossed out a couple of times. I have. I have. Yeah. Um, and I've always been a really big heckler. I've, you know, I'm always like throwing one, never a softball, uh, directly over at the other side, uh, trying to hit them where it hurts, trying to poke at them to get the attention that we need it right and um successfully at points unsuccessfully at other points um but uh but yeah there is no heckling happening now whatsoever i literally say one word and it's come to order and <laughs> if i say two words it's hamilton mountain come to order like it is it is that bad yeah um, 
once in a would like every once in a while I'll throw one just to get I want them to call me out you know what I mean so at least the speaker has to say my writing so <laughs> at least the people in the audience know that oh there's Taylor right so um like it's it's just really it's awful it's taken away um all of the uh, the, the back and forth of it and that uh, ability to raise all of those issues and to really poke hard um, at them and to watch them when they when you poke at them then they flounder right then they get angry they say things that they shouldn't say I mean we've all we've all witnessed that um, but even just as much as introductions like we I would introduce all of the autism families every single day. And they got really angry with it and they changed the way that introductions happened in the house so that I couldn't do that anymore, right? So they changed the, the and they changed the rules regularly to be able yeah. to suit their needs. To control, to control I every, every message that comes that. out of the park. Yeah. I did not realize that. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. that, ha that happened during the time that- That uh, happened because of the chicks? Because of the chicks and the six. Because of the chicks and right. the six. For the, for the people in the community who don't <laughs> know, there is, uh, I would say, between how uh, eight and ten people in the chicks from the six. Who Give or take. show up at Queen's Park every and Miko. single day. And Miko. Yeah. But he's, he's one of the chicks, you know. Uh, sure. Would show up at Queen's Park every single day for mm -hmm. our, a six-month, eighth-month period. I, for years, it's been happening. But yes, in yeah. the last eight months for, for over or a year uh, at least I mean you all spent that time about, in my office I, yeah so about, about a year so from from the announcement <laughs> in 2000 February 2019 yeah. until we weren't allowed anymore because of the pandemic in March of 2020 so pretty much a full year mm -hmm. We hope to do a Facebook Live to talk to the chicks about their antics. We we did one, uh, and I'd like to do more. I mean, I think they're all a bunch of little birds with their wings cut clipped because uh, they can't show up at the office. But get ready, get ready, yeah. Teresa. Let's let's get into the OAP, shall we? Yeah. So, Monique, families have learned some very hard lessons in the last chunk of years waiting their turn for services only to have the rug pulled out from them in 2016 by liberal age caps and then even worse the Ford government with their flat rate funding how could a government safeguard supports for autistic children and not let this happen a third time well by electing new democrats <laughs> That's how we safeguard them because New Democrats believe in services. We believe that your kids deserve what they need. And we believe that people should be able to function in, in society fairly. And so, you know, uh, <laughs> that's that's how we're going to do it. We're going to ensure that every child, regardless of the diagnosis, gets the services that they need uh, to be able to reach their full potential. And so, I mean, I don't have a better answer for you than that, um, because that that is our, our whole you know being uh is making sure that that people get what they need and but, but, but Monique what happens if um we get an NDP government and then four years later it's no longer an NDP government and that's what happened the liberals created a plan the PCs yeah. came in throughout the liberal plan who's to say that when the NDPs are no longer government, they become so government that the new government won't throw out the NDP plan Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, but I can tell you that uh, I, sh I shouldn't, I sh I'm not the critic on this anymore. <laughs> oh, you know what? I'll, we'll get to so, Teresa. We'll get to you. I know, so. but you know what? You know what's important is that we've heard parents. We know that you don't want another program, that you are tired of program after program and falling through the cracks each time, right? So I think the comment um, about how do we safeguard that has to be something that is that you're constantly pushing at us to make sure that it's ingrained into mm -hmm. our program uh, moving forward. And we, I'll let we'd like to dig, we'd like to dig in a little bit more in this topic. Angela, which ministry is currently running, running autism services? That is MCCS the Ministry of Children, Community, and Social Services. It used to be two separate ministries before the PCs uh, became government. It used to be Ministry of Youth and Children's Services, and those are the, that is the ministry that used to house the Ontario Autism Program, and then there's the Community and Social Services, and then they merged them together. 
So it is it's kind of an interesting concept, isn't it? When you talk about children's services, we're talking about, you know, children's aid societies, we're talking about youth correction, we're talking about youth mental health, we're talking about um, autism, we're talking about all of these things that will lead them into adults in the social service system. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like, thanks. Thanks mm -hmm. for, for your foresight. Thanks for your hope. Thanks for letting folks know that there is something else for them in life. Like it just speaks to their entire uh, package and how they deal with things. I mean, they, they cut the child advocate, yeah. right? Like, yeah. So, I mean, they're ruthless. It's and the the mindset. No so Ther Teresa, do you have a sense of why a, a therapeutic program run by clinicians should be run by social services. Well, is run by social services. Yeah. Why is it, as an insurance broker, as a person <laughs> with a background in long-term care, why is a therapy program funded by social services? Well, I think the government is trying to uh, not silence, but avoid, avoid if it, if it isn't children and services to actually specialize in that merging the two, it does kind of gray the waters and blend them together. So it, the government also, if you uh, remember, they took the long-term care file out of uh, the healthcare portfolio. So they did a bunch of shuffling. And I mean, the Ford government, when they were elected, they said they're gonna look for efficiencies. Nobody knew what those looked like. So under their guise of efficiency, is it more efficient just to lump everybody together as opposed to having that specialized ministry so it actually is effective? Uh, to service uh, children with autism. Um, and so, you know, that's not their priority. And I think that's why they merged the two, the two uh, programs, the two ministries. It's not a priority for them. And they don't, I mean, as a government, it's never been a priority for conservatives to worry about the most vulnerable, whether it be economics uh, for income, like ODSP, or whether it's for uh, you know, children with development disabilities or children with autism. Um, it's never been their priority to worry about the most vulnerable. And youth is one of those things I think that they are lacking on when it comes to strength. Monique just pointed out the child care youth advocate was cancelled. Like that doesn't make any sense. We fought for that for years to give children in care a voice and um, they remove that. So it speaks to what their and he, and he, he found out about his um, exit by media. He wasn't well, even there. Exactly. So there's no respect there. And the fact that they've merged those two things, it just means they are not prioritizing that children youth file. They're encompassing the social services for efficiency purposes, as far as I'm concerned, to save money. And, uh, and it's wrong. And so, you know, it, the, the, when the government in 2018 told everybody uh, about their platform, I think it was 15 pages, there were no details, uh, no one knew it was coming. And so all these things, all these announcements um, are just literally um, a shell game and people are trying to keep up with stuff. And now you're, you're now pushed into the Ministry of Children and Social Services and nobody knew that was happening. Why wasn't that something that they would have discussed in a platform? That's a big, big piece um, of changing the way kids were looked after in a ministry, right? So again, efficiencies merge to merge the ministries have dual uh, roles. People do more than they're supposed to, and you do lose focus when that happens. Could the NDP consider, or maybe you do, behind closed closed doors, at looking at our system a whole new new way? We that the new way. At the OAC, we muse a lot. We talk a lot amongst ourselves. And we'll, we'll, we'll discuss a system where supports could be, say, funded by health care, delivered by education, and then mediated by social services. Is that a model that the NDP discusses or, or looks at? Right now, I think um, I would say that your, uh, your community has gone through so much. And for us to start changing the way, it, the way it's delivered, the way it's funded, um, would really like to first take a real good look at what the government has done and figure out if there is a way to have, um, you know, 
ministries collaborate and work together, how that looks and how that's going to service the people um, who need those services is, is yet to be determined. So I know like with, with we look at the housing or the homelessness piece, um, there's a lot of interministerial um, dynamics going on there, but it doesn't work as well as it should. So it's a, it's a matter of right now, um, how, if that is an option to look at that, how to review that and how to make sure it's a success without changing it and making it more mm -hmm. problematic. Um, so is it something that uh, we can have discussions on? Absolutely. Is it something that is in the, something that's been talked about at this point? Um, not formally. But we have to consider, as I say, you know, looking at things proactively, is that something that is going to um, help with children with autism? So the last, things we want, the last thing we want to do is make sure that kids aren't falling through the cracks. But definitely, I agree that um, if it's about a continuity of care from a diagnosis through adulthood, we need to talk about interministerial approaches and what that looks like. Angela? Do we know how many autistic children and adults there are in Ontario? We don't have an exact number, but we do know that one to 2% of the population has autism. Um, a couple years ago, uh, Autism Ontario um, did do a census and it was about 135,000. Um, I estimate that there's over 150,000 uh, people with autism in the province right now. Might be a good start for us to know for sure, wouldn't it? There are a lot of things data. You have to have data accordingly, right? Like, is that data tracked? Like, we could we could put in an FOI and see if we get that information. I'll bet you, ten to one, it's not there, right? Um, and that they just don't keep that kind of information and put and tally it together. So how can you it create do and many implement papers. programs if you don't know how many people are out there? That's why they don't do it. Well, that's, that's why they don't do it. That's also one of the reasons that the Ontario Autism Program uh, was under the Ministry of, Community, of, of Children and Youth Services as opposed to health, because there was no idea about incidents, right? When they first started the program, they, they had no idea what the incidents would be um, with autism and what the uptake would be for the program. And if it went under the Ministry of Health, then they couldn't limit it. Mm -hmm. Didn't but, the cur current minister, Todd Smith, say he wants to serve as many children as possible not all kids right so there's there's no guarantee for service no for any child in this province no and their their definition of service is wonky <laughs> what's their definition of service can anyone help me understand this well when um jeremy roberts responded uh to teresa's uh question um, a few weeks ago um, about the Ontario Autism Program. He was saying that, you know, there were, I forget the number, but there was all these children that were receiving support and support and service. It seems to me that they just, it means something like, oh, give them a few bucks and now they're supported. There's a big difference between needs-based <clears throat> meeting the needs of, of the children that, that require $5,000 payments that they can pretty people can pretty much spend whatever they want is supporting children, right? Yeah. So they can tie it into their numbers to bump their numbers to make them look good, even though those kids are not in service, yeah. right? And yeah. Mom and dad bought what they needed, right? Uh, to be able to support them. Particularly, we know that they were buying a lot of different things and they were okay for different things through through COVID, right? Uh, so a trampoline I've heard or different things that made sense for their child, right? Uh, to be able to, to get through this. But that child is in the number of receiving supports. Yeah, and so, but $5,000, um, when my son uh, was first diagnosed, uh, you know, he had his high needs. Um, his program was $80,000 a year. What, what would $5,000 do for me? Is so kind of getting $80,000 in service a year right now? My, so, oh, the, uh, there might be a few, a few, there might be a couple thousand children that are getting that, 
because uh, they are grandfathered into the old liberal program. Uh, yes, and we have a population of legacy children who yeah. are essentially in a holding pattern where some who due to COVID who may have transitioned into school or are unable to do so, uh, you know, I mean, it's a mess, it's a mess. But when, when um, the program was destroyed by McLeod, there were over 10,000 kids who were actually getting what they needed. Um, now, I think it's probably four, three to 4,000. So mm -hmm. not only did they destroy the program, there's way fewer kids actually getting their needs met. And how many children are waiting for service now, Angela? Over 40,000. Over 40,000. Teresa or Monique? As members of the opposition, do either of you have any kind of access to bureaucrats in the ministry? Ah. <laughs> is, that a, is that a joke? <laughs> no. I have this blue phone on my desk. I can pick it up and I get Todd Smith. No, <laughs> there's, no <laughs> there's no direct access. Um, you know, it, it's, it's very untimely access. Uh, I can tell you that I tabled some questions. I shared them with I think Angela, you, they were shared with you the questions that um, we put on the table to, an, to be answered yeah. and uh, written questions. And uh, we literally got a robotic answer. They answered every question the same. So, so you know, so when, when that kind of um, response and really truly disrespect and disregard for the serious questions that were asked about this program, just get answered uh, the same response over and over again. Um, there's your access. I mean, we, we try to put the written, que so we, qu written questions on the table so we can hold them accountable, right? Get the real answers. Um, we don't get them. We get, a, we get a briefing, you know, at a certain point. I, um, I understand everybody's busy, but I mean, come on, this is a, a very important file. So uh, when I did get my ministerial briefing, again, did not get any straight answers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, when we ask questions, I mean, it is question period, but we still, we get, you know, the dancing around the, the questions. It's talking points. Yeah. So they don't even address period. the question. It's just the question same talking points period. on repeat. Mm -hmm. So access to them is uh, limited and very uh, seldom. Uh, as much access you have to them is probably the same or worse that we have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Angela is very tenacious, and she has managed to schedule a few meetings. Uh, with with the they, bureaucrats, not the, bureaucrats, bureaucrats, not the ministry. I, the ministry doesn't want to see us, it seems. And I would say that just from my experience, I think you guys get more access to bureaucrats than we do. Yeah. Like, I would love it when you came back from your meetings and you would feed me, right? Like, that is our role um and what it's come down to as politicians is we learn from our people that's do you know right. what i mean that's where we get the our answers that's where we get our questions from right like we don't necessarily get the answers but we know what we're looking for then right uh because because we listen to real life people um but but to get the answers out of the uh, the government or the bureaucrats it's it's tough yes it's, it's like pulling teeth we, we have received a number of emails back where it was the answers were clearly cut and paste mm -hmm. uh, and sent back to us. Uh, and this has been since since this particular group yeah. have been elected. And, and that's uh, that's what new, Teresa was not talking for about. Us. That's what, yes, I know that has mm -hmm. been our experience. Mm -hmm. Have governments ever addressed capacity? of service when we talked about we don't know how many kids are out there we don't know how many adults are sure they did are they there. cut it they capped it at five they capped it here they capped it there that's the only way we've ever seen them address capacity in my knowledge <laughs> you know what i mean it's never been more than than what they like five how many how often how many times do we fight it doesn't end at five right and um and then the the conservatives were four four or five were right um, so that's how I think how they deal with capacity. I don't, I don't see them dealing with the whole capacity ever. I don't, I've never experienced. No. That. So, so the, the liberal government attempted, but it was very close to the end of their uh, term. So they didn't get anywhere. Um, and of course this government decimated capacity. 
Um, there, there is a, a workplace survey that they did in 2020 looking at um, autism professionals, SLP, OT, um, BCBAs. Um, the last meeting we had with the bureaucrats, uh, they said they were going to share with us that the report was ready, that they were just looking at doing some final touches. I have so far emailed a few times following up when that meeting will be where they uh, share the results with us. I have um, only heard crickets so far. I heard this, well, I had the same experience. So in March, uh, mid-March, I met with the ministry bureaucrats and they said that they're still doing analytics analytics um, on the fall 2020 uh, province-wide capacity assessment service gap. So that's what that was in mid-March. Mm -hmm. And they said they'd be rolling out the workforce capacity initiatives in the next year. Um, but we're not sure what they will be or how they will be devised. So, and, and Angela, I was, you know, she filled in, she got the same answer. So there hasn't been an update as far as I'm aware. And uh, it's still, again, half an answer. It's just a plan that they say they're going to do it, but we don't, we don't hear the results. And, and uh, I don't know if they'll ever share that uh, with anyone publicly or not. As, as a statistician, I'm happy to do the raw data, get the raw data. I can do the analytics myself. <laughs> you can. That's why she's our president. That's right. Uh, what's it like to have a parent knocking on your door mm. as MPPs with, uh, you know, they've been to their schools, they've been to their daycares, there's no services for these families. What's that like for you? Monique, if you want to speak to it, then I can add to it or I can go first. Um, it it tears my heart out. Yeah. As soon as they start talking, I, I literally feel my chest fall because I know that I can't, I have no magic wand. And then I know that there's families waiting everywhere. And this family's desperate, right? Like they have their own needs, they have their own story and they, they're looking to us for hope. And, uh, and the most that we can do is like coddle them and try to push them in the direction that they and make sure that they have all the tools, uh, that they know where they need to be, that they're, the, you know, that they're doing all of that work, but also making sure that we don't raise their expectations um, because we know that it's like a dark tunnel, right? Um, so that's how I feel about it. Um, and um, yeah, I'll let Teresa answer how Teresa, she said. So, what, what's it, what is that experience like? Yeah, right now I can tell you, you know, the knocking on the door. Again, we were talking this, uh, talking about this before the meeting. How much more uh, severity there is, or impact there is, when you meet someone in person, right? So, I mean, virtually, I've met with your group, and I can feel um, the, the frustration, the exhaustion the devastation of all the work that you've done and you thought you got somewhere, you know, and then the rug was pulled out from under you when it came under the conservative government. Mm -hmm. And for me, when someone comes to my door or, you know, I'm listening to them on the phone, I want to, first of all, be supportive, right? Because sometimes they just need to be heard mm -hmm. because they, they feel like no one's listening. Right. Um, and then as Monique said, you know, trying to advocate for them, and pushing, even if we know, and again, the expectations have to be managed, absolutely. I make no promises, I make no guarantees because we know this government won't uh, do the right thing. Even when there are situations that are so dire, they will just go by the book because they have to stick to their little template. Um, but that doesn't mean we do not advocate fiercely for them, whether it's, you know, question period, whether it's writing alerts to the government, whether it's, uh, you know, calling the liaison and telling their story in hopes that they will have some, you know, empathy to understand how broken the system is. Maybe they can't, like I say, you know, it's not case by case, whether you give somebody extra money or not extra money, so they have to follow their formula. But when, you know, when we keep pushing and, and driving home those stories that, you know, they will understand the system is broken, the system isn't working and families need them to step up. Mm -hmm. And so when, when families come to me and it's literally, it's the last resort because they don't know where else to turn. Mm -hmm. And so we do the best we can to advocate for them and support them and um, try to get them through the, the worst time. And right now with COVID, it's even worse, right? It's even it, it more. Was very, it was very wa interesting watching you in the first few days of your appointment, Teresa. And uh, the OAC, we are happy to, we'll meet with anybody. Yeah. We, you know, and I don't mean you're just anybody, but we oh. will. 
that that is how we distinguish ourselves. i want you to Teresa's special we, we, no i we want are, you to meet with everybody well we are a political organization yeah. right we are not a support group we nope. we do support one another but we're about the systems of support for for people who need it right and it was very interesting to see watch your face as we were briefing you into a kind of you're kidding you're kidding you're ki and it's it <laughs> I've had this experience many, many times. Um, I happen to know that Monique is a grandma and a mom. I don't know if you're a parent or not, Teresa. Uh, but the treatment of these families, is this something that you ever imagined as a parent, as somebody who put your child through the school system and daycares and all of that, that did you think it was possible for it to be this like this as bad. bad as it is? Well, first I do have two adult children and I have a granddaughter that's nine and then I have a set of twins that are four. So I'm a grandmother to uh, three wonderful girls. <laughs> um, no, and, and I have to say like to listen to other parents, all we want is the best for our children, right? All we need is for the, so those supports so that we can, they can be their best selves. And we know that there's potential in, in all children. But when there's children who need that extra support and extra help, and they need it based on their needs, and someone is not providing that, and that's the government's responsibility, it, it not, did, not that it, it, I guess it shocked me, because when I think about what I was fighting for long-term care, and the fact that the basic needs weren't being met for people in long-term care, and look what's out there now, and I think, no, that can't be happening. It shouldn't be happening uh, when we're talking about our children, our you know, most vulnerable youth, most vulnerable seniors, right? This, the spectrum on the fact, on the way that we're not looking after our most vulnerable on both ends um, in life is really a reflection of our society. And it really just, it made me feel like, no, this can't be happening. No, this isn't why you know and I was just literally shocked and disgusted and f felt for the families that you know why can't your children get the therapy that they need there's no reason for that and government needs to invest up front in children so that they can be their best lives when they grow up and and experience different adulthood milestones but to keep them um, you know uh, to keep the funding so tight and restricted, you're creating other, as I said earlier, as an insurance broker, it's not proactive and you're going to create another problem down the road. So why not address the issues when they're younger, when their needs need to happen and follow them through their journey into adulthood and the continuum needs to happen. I mean, I've heard from parents, it just doesn't change once they turn 18. You know. Why is it then that we can't, the OAC can't seem to embarrass this government? Like we live through the reign of Lisa McLeod, the queen of mean, uh, you know, <laughs> it's like the best episode of Dance Moms ever, right? <laughs> to, to Todd Smith's nice guy at arm's length, length approach. And COVID has been a very convenient buffer for these guys. In 2016, we seem to be able to show the liberals that hurting vulnerable children was bad for business. Why can't we get through to this government? Why can't we shame these characters? Well, I, I, think, I think it's what Teresa was saying about um, not being able to meet in person because we, we were moving slowly, but we were moving before the, the pandemic. And I've met with you know, different union leaders and um, other <laughs> organizations, and they're always so impressed with the Ontario Autism Coalition because we're, we're not a large organization but uh, we are a grassroots advocacy group that actually made this government stutter. And a lot of these other organizations were looking to us, to, trying to figure out how they can do what we did. So we, we were on the right track, but now without being able to meet in person, um, if, if the politicians don't pick up the phone or answer our emails, what is our recourse? Before our recourse, my personal recourse was to show up in person, hound them. And because you can't get away from my face if I'm in yours, in your face. So, <laughs> we, so we have a government now who've changed the rules when it comes to debate. 
where your voices are being stifled. You're not able to, what, you get sat on the, the instant you say your name, right? And we have politicians who are not answering the phone. Is that correct? Angela, what's it oh, like? Oh, yeah. Oh, no, they don't. What I, is it like for the parents out there who have been trying to contact their MPPs right now, Angela? Well, I can tell you, um, I had a meeting, and I'm going to call them out because I don't care. Um, I had a meeting back in January with Stan Cho. He is the MPP right beside my riding, and I met with him with another person from his riding, um, and he promised us a follow-up in February. Uh, we're in May. I have written six or seven follow-up emails to get that follow-up meeting. I, you know, first I was really happy to get the initial meeting thinking maybe we will get somewhere, but now we're in May and at least six email follow-ups and a couple phone calls, nothing. I have heard nothing. So, you know, if your MPP is uh, PC, uh, trying to get a meeting. I don't know if they've been told in caucus meetings to not answer phones or respond to emails. It's possible. But um, from my experience and anecdotally, the experience of other parents is they're just completely not responsive. Is this democracy? <laughs> no. You know, I think why you can't embarrass them because they actually think they did it. They, they think that they've delivered the program that you've been waiting for. Right. And so, you they know, can't possibly think that too. I really think they do, because this government, it doesn't want to look beyond what what they don't want to see. But I can tell you that, um, you know, the slogan that Doug Ford used was for the people. Right. It's not for the people. So if you're a big donor, you can get through. You can get through their 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 wall. Right. They'll listen. Um, they're going to pay attention to you. Um, so with the autism file and, and people who are trying to get them meetings and change, you know, it's, it's not, they don't, they don't believe that they've, that they need to change. What they've done is what you've been waiting for. We, Hey, hooray. We're all superstars in the legislature. My superstar star team, all stars. This is what he constantly says, right? We're all superstars. We're all our st all stars. Yeah. Um, you know, we're all for the people, um, you know, because they actually believe that they delivered the program that you need. They so, can. you know, I, mean, I, I, I think you're right. But um, how stupid do you have to be to believe that when you see so many outraged parents? <laughs> it, but and they're and they're ducking for cover, right? Like they're using COVID as their cover that they don't have to deliver right now. They don't yeah. have to put up with you protesters. They don't have to put up with you putting in their face. Todd Smith sitting back with his feet on his desk because yeah. he can breathe, right? Like so. And ideally, they they now they're having fundraisers for a thousand dollars. How much was the plate? Was it a thousand bucks? Was for it a thousand? Zoom, a thousand. For a Zoom call. Yeah. So, so there's your accessibility. Um, you know, there's your democracy. If you can pay to play, I guess they'll listen to you. Um, but yeah, this COVID has been a, I think, a good thing for them because they, they're not being held accountable by people knocking on their door, showing up. Tony right? says. Can, yeah. Tony says. So, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, when you, Teresa, when you were saying for the people. You're absolutely right, because when I was meeting MPPs in person, mm -hmm. that was one of the things I would say. I would say, is my child not a person? Good. And that, that would hit hard. Mm -hmm. Ford bought them all na a little for the people nameplates yeah. for their desk. Yeah. Literally that. They, he, they printed these little, you know, the old fashioned little metal grapes. And uh, yeah, it was Vic Fideli uh, at the time, Minister of Finance, brought it in and showed us, like, we have all these on our desks. We're here for the people. We're like, oh, no, you're not. They, you're match, the, they match the people big time plates. donors. Yeah. yeah. I'm, sure they, I, wow. I'm sure they uh, match the license plates. Tony <laughs> says, we're tired of being treated like garbage by this government. Virginia says, what's happening now is that the majority of the autism community is moving into adulthood and they've missed early interventions or ha and haven't had their needs met. They have missed those milestones. It's catch up time. And, th and that's what Teresa was saying. It's that preventative thing. And I think the best phrase to summarize that is pay now or pay later. 
right. And what's going to happen to all these young people who are turning into adults as their parents age, and we don't have the supports in place to be able to, to give them those wraparound services because they're going to need housing at some point. They're going to That's need, right. you know, a, a job. They're going to need a quality of life, and there is nothing in place to be able to support that. Let's talk yep. about wraparound services. What the heck is that? What the heck is what that? Do we mean, what do we mean by that? Like, we throw that out there. What does that look like? To me, to yeah. me, wrap around, yeah, to me, wraparound services make is making sure that you have the behavioral services that you need, that you have the OT that you need, you have the speech that you need, that you have the guidance of a, a navigator or a support person to stay with you through your journey uh, and ensure that you have all of those services. So pe people and um, uh, organization, whatever it could be, uh, you know, I've always liked the family navigator uh, to be able to to support you as you move through life, right? Um, and to, to be able to to be there. Like, I hear that some countries have social workers for what for life. Yeah, imagine the concept. What do, you, right? what do you think of that? Imagine the concept. Yeah. Would that save money or would that just it would totally save money and it would totally save so tell us how tell how, how would health? that save money well i mean well, when i said pay now or pay later i meant pay now or pay more later that's right yeah. so you provide services you give behavioral services you give speech services to a child then they're able to speak they're able to function in life they're able to to get things done you've saved money on on the supports that are going to be necessary later in life hopefully that person will be able to now get a job live independently uh you know that you've given them the tools to be able to succeed and to reach their full potential when you starve them from that as a child you're now allowing them to grow up without the basis and the foundations and the layers that they needed to be able to survive. Angela and I have something in common, which is that we had to leave the workforce in order to support our, our children yeah. or our, our sons. Yeah. Uh, what about that lost income? You know, we are not no longer taxpayers. Okay. We are no longer wage earners. Yeah. Absolutely. Isn't that a drain on society? Huge drain. And it is mostly, I mean, a lot of some men too, but it's mostly women, you know, um, the females uh, that take on that role. And, um, you know, it's, it's, again, it's, it's a, it's a gap in your, in someone's career as well. So when you're, you know, let's say you want to get back into the workforce that looks uh, poorly, you know, on a resume, people, well, why were you at home, you know, and, and it's also start, um, would affect your wages too. When you're away from work, you may be starting at a different wage uh, level, as opposed to that continuum that you were always in the workforce. And, you know, again, people are losing talent. you know, women are very resourceful, they're very resilient, and they're extra smart. Um, and they're wonderful to work with. And when we lose that workforce, it is taking value out of the economy. And as Angela said, they're contributing members to a tax base, um, they're contributing members, members to a successful economy. And it and it speaks to the fact again you're putting the burden back on families because the resources aren't there the, the initial investment isn't there, and that shouldn't have to be the kind of decisions families make. I mean, I spoke to someone in the uh, in the autism community, where um, you know they had to quit their job and look after their child, and um, when they're ready to go back into the workforce, that is a barrier that they have now. When they're ready to enter so it 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 doesn't help the situation at all and when people leave their jobs that's a loss of income to the family so how do you replace that you know it you're, you're also looking at some people are financing their homes like taking lines of credits um, in order to make sure the kids get the therapy that they need so it's it's nobody wins in that case at all yeah. Yeah, either either like me um, you have absolutely zero left for retirement, or you can't provide for your child at all, because honestly, spending $80,000 a year is unattainable for 99.9% .9 of the population. Yeah. I'd like to go. Oh, sorry, yeah, okay, I just wanted to say something because I was thinking okay. about it. So yeah. there was a study put out by Janet McLaughlin, if you know who she is. Um, well, yeah, of course. <laughs> And in it, it really talks about this issue where women, it's primarily women have to leave 
the workforce um, in order to stay home. Either they need to leave or they need to uh, reduce their hours substantially. And one of the things after I read the report about myself that I used to say was, um, I used to be a statistician, but now I'm a statistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It'd be very interesting if, uh, if somebody could uh, hire Angela to do uh, some studying, like how much income has been lost versus the versus what the money being put into the programs versus what kids need uh the, and, and tie in the time you know like we angela and myself are service navigators that mm -hmm. is what we do that is a very large part of our of our day every single day and yeah. um i think both of us would rather be working anyway uh, i i'd like to go and get inside baseball a little bit with i do i do work just not for money Yes. Well, exactly. <laughs> Angela, could let's talk about DFOs and DSOs a little bit. Now, this is a sticking point for a lot of people in the community, and they may um, uh, be on side with the NDP except for this one point. However, I'd like to clarify, Teresa, no pressure. Uh, what are your thoughts on DFO versus DSO? So, Angela, could you please give us a quick description of what yeah. I mean by these acronyms? Yeah, so DSO stands for direct service option. DFO stands for direct funding option. DSO is um, when you receive services through a government run uh, mm -hmm. program. Uh, so, you know, that would be the regional providers. Um, they would deliver the services for your child and um, there's no uh, money management or anything like that required uh, by the parents. Uh, the DFO uh, scenario is um, the parent finds a private provider, the government gives the money to the parent and the parent uh, pays the provider as necessary. So that's, that's the basic gist between the two concepts. Let me, let me sort of run through things a little bit more for you, Teresa. I hope this isn't too long, but um, so if we're funding services with, with public money, uh, what I want to explore is what is private, quote unquote, what is a private service versus a public service? Many parents express concerns, as I mentioned, that the NDP would remove direct funded providers from the scene. And the OAC has been very vocal about conflicts of interests that uh, regional providers have, for example, being banker, dispatcher, and service provider. We also have received many damning complaints that parents have never accessed their clinician uh, when they are at a, a large regional provider and instead dealt with administrators who treat their service like it's a giant turnstile. And we have hundreds of stories of kids who have been in and out and released from service far too prematurely. Many, uh, and Angela and I fall in, into this camp, uh, found that smaller providers were more welcoming, they were geographically more convenient and family-centered, unlike these big giant providers. How would the NDP address these challenges? There, there, there also isn't the, con the uh, conflict of interest with DFOs because they don't manage the government money, whereas the regional providers did. So there's a bit of a conflict of interest with the DSO. Um, so they, they were acting a bit like gatekeepers, whereas with the private providers, they, you know, there's, there's no conflict. So, I mean, the NDP, uh, you know, foundationally believes that uh, publicly funded, publicly delivered uh, services are the best way to lay that foundation for equity, right? Um, but I have to say, your families have been through so much, right? You've been through the ringer with different programs between liberals and conservatives. And I know that you like um, the flexibility of that and that um, we're not here, um, you know, to go in there and start, you know, changing everything. I think what we need to do is we need to first understand what families have gone through and they don't want any more uncertainty. And uh, they were looking, they're looking for someone to hear what works for them. And 
if if we're elected as government and we get onto that file, I wanted to do a whole review. I want to understand what the program is about because as far as we know, we haven't got the answers that we've been looking for. So we're all still have so many questions about what it is, how it operates, you know, what the numbers are, what the capacity is. Um, so at this point, I'm not, I'm going to say that the NDP, it would not be going in and starting to change things at that point. Can't you commit to that. You wouldn't destroy the whole thing and then make us wait for four years until you have um, something new? Yeah. No. Oh, oh, do you want us to? I think it's hundred percent. No, it's no what way. What are you saying, Angela? <laughs> no, in the, no, in the words of Ford, a thousand percent no. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's, it's respecting families, right? And if you're going to make any changes, you need to, first of all, uh, get that information out there, right? I mean, no matter what government it is, I don't think you make a decision and then, you know, two months later, it's done. It needs to be a consultative basis and you need to hear what's going on and then make those informed decisions of how it's going to be delivered for families with stability. The autism families and the children that have um, experienced that unsettling, you know, you get you get hope and the rug gets pulled up from under you. You get hope and then, you know, you don't know the answers to anything. You, you can't, don't have access to your, the people that deliver these programs or politicians. You can't go through that again. So, I mean, no, I, I can't foresee that I would be going in there and changing the system. I'd be looking at it. I don't know what it looks like and I'd be reviewing it and making those decisions very thoughtfully. Um, if I'm in charge of that file, you know, I would, and I would be fighting tooth and nail <laughs> to make sure that those things are done thoughtfully. They are as preventative, um, so we don't have crises. We are looking at, and even decisions we make today, what do they look like in the future? I really believe that that's something that has to happen. It's not the moment, it's what's in front of us today and how is that gonna look, you know, you know, I know it's a four year term government if it's a majority, which is unfortunate, but how that looks in four years, how that looks in eight years, how that looks in 12 years. And it has to be a routine where there's an audit, where there's a check of those things regularly, because not every system, even when the intent is there to make it work, that it actually delivers the outcomes that people intend, right? So, you know, put it in place, make sure the machine's working and give it a tune up all the time to make sure it's still producing or, you know, performing what you expect. And, and, and we're talking about human beings, right? So that's even more essential to me that we make sure we get it right. People's lives are at stake and you don't play with people's lives when it comes to children, when it comes to seniors. And I, and I use both of those because I mean, they're both close to my heart. Um, when it comes to children and when it comes to seniors, no games, it has to be done so that people's lives are not turned upside down and they're begging at your door for help. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I have, I still am a little bit confused um, in terms of uh, wh what we think of being as a private service and versus a public service. If, if the regional providers works are, are receiving funding directly, as opposed to funding uh, that parents receive and use, couldn't this all be so solved with just direct billing? If people are going to hang up their shingle, I mean, we have doctors all over the province why can't we have service providers all over the province in small hubs? I, again, I think it's about transparency when it comes to financial accountability. Um, and I, and I think that's where we come from a place from the NDP where it's, if it's publicly delivered and public or publicly funded and publicly delivered, we can look at the books, right? But when it's a private institution, you can't just go in there and look at the books. Can I raise, can I raise something yeah. to happened uh, back years ago under the Liberals? We yeah. know that we had, uh, like, we had providers that were, like, totally land blasting parents just because the bill was going to get paid, right? They had more hours booked for this child than was physically possible. Like, mm -hmm. these are the types of things that, you know, um, that, that need to be looked at. They need, there needs to be accountability. There needs to be transparency. Uh, and there needs to be, I mean, we know how precious our public dollars are. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how do we how do we allow them to go out the door to be used responsibly and to make sure that we have enough left for the next child? Is that is that in a huge for-profit system? 
that's something that's that's where most of our discrepancies come up, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but Monique, ironically, the for profit providers charge half of what the well, <laughs> and that's that's because that's because they know that they have to build like that in that system, right? So how do you build in mechanisms to ensure that? You know, like just like it's yeah. it's a hard one because as a new democrat i'm like public services public services because if it was me i would have fixed the dso's before i would have blown them up right yeah. I, I would have created accountability. I would have made sure that, 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 that there were mechanisms in place to ensure that there was parental trust, that there was, you know, that, that there wasn't that, uh, you know, fox taking care of the hen house as, as, as parents have found. And rightfully yeah. so, the system was broken, mm -hmm. right? Like I, I was the first one to admit that, but it needed to be fixed. Right. Yeah. Um, and now, yeah. and, and, but we also needed uh, that equity across the province. What happens in the North and in, in Northwest and Northeast and Toronto and Hamilton is all completely different. Right. Yeah. We have to build according to our communities. Uh, Absolutely. You know, but I, what I'm thinking of like is, is big versus small and what is most suitable for young children. Like well, I'm, you, I'm going to assume that when you sent your kids to a daycare, you daycare, you didn't have to travel 30 miles, 40 miles to go to this big, huge building that's real shiny with a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of people working there. Uh, you're, you're you're talking about a service for very young children who whose lives are small. Right. But nope. if you talk about those same services and we talk about the wraparound services, when they went to those facilities, everything was in place for them there. Right. They didn't, mm -hmm. parents didn't have to go and try to find speech. They didn't have to go find OT. They didn't have to go and find uh, this and that. It was all taken care of. Right. Mm -hmm. all, of the, all of the service, it, like you had somebody sit down with you and say, your child needs this, 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 and this, and this. No, nope. that, that, provided as that wasn't my experience. That wasn't I, my experience. Yes, so well, it should have been. Well, it, I agree. <laughs> I agree. Right. Like we, both, we all agree. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Like, well, let, can, can I, can you, can I tell you a story? I'll try, I'll try to be brief. Sorry, Karen, I just tell want to, you, I just yeah. want to tell no, let Monique, me tell a quick story. A quick I want to story. tell Monique something though. Um, you were talking about the um, private providers that were, you know, really uh, gouging. Uh, and it's true, there were a few, but it was only, only a few uh, bad actors and they painted a bad name for the rest. So, you know, I, I agree that there were a few, but there should have been uh, checks and balances um, to, to control for those. And that's why we need things like regulation and we needed audits. Um, so okay. although, I, although I, I agree with you, Monique, they existed, but there weren't very many. There really yeah. weren't very many. Well, like, let, me, let me tell you a very quick story, super quick of, of an experience Sorry, I had. So I, my son, I sent my son to a direct service provider first. And uh, we'll talk about myself. I'll talk about someone I met. And I met a woman and, uh, you know, I guess you can gather I'm one of these people that says, good morning. And I try to figure out who my friends are right away. Who's going to be my friend here, right? And there would be a woman I would see every single morning. Morning, hi, hi. And she was just, yeah very, very, uh, she, she sort of leaning up against the wall and she was holding a baby. And I, as I would see her every morning, I'd realize that she was completely white and she had a newborn and she had a very robust, sturdy six-year-old boy who was just starting therapy, same time as my kid. And this lady eventually started to talk to me and she told me that she took three buses to get to her regional provider, right? Yeah. And, and this is a big place with a lot of people and you arrive, your therapist greets you, and then they go off to another room and they go and do their thing, right? And it's busy. It's a really busy hub with a lot of coming and going. And nobody noticed this woman leaning up against the wall, just trying to keep a grip, her face white, holding a newborn, having taken three buses in February to get to this site in Scarborough, which is remote. Scarborough is a huge area and it's our only provider, right? And her son, she told me, the thing that he was into was reaching into strangers' pockets, which sounds funny and it, 
except no. in a Scarborough bus on rush hour where you're cheek to jowl and you have a non-speaking child who bolts from you, you have your newborn in the sling and is grabbing for men's pockets and reaching into men's pockets and pulling out whatever he can get, right? Yeah. Now, nobody noticed this lady. This is not a full service, right? You have to get your kid there. There's no busing. You know, so if you're lucky enough, you won the lottery, woohoo, you get into the service, you waited two years, four years, five years for this service, and you've just had a baby, and you get, you know, anyway, so, so getting that boy, and then getting herself home with that baby, and then coming back and getting that boy home during rush hour, not a single staff person noticed this woman's distress. Part this is common. This is, this is common, not a single person. At my smaller provider, I guarantee you that because you have a relationship with the admins, you're on a first name basis, it's a good morning. She would have been given a chair. She would have been a, given a corner to nurse her baby. She would have been, and I know this would have happened, this provider would have begged, borrowed, and steer, stole to advocate for this mother to arrange for busing for this boy, even though TDSB says they don't do that. But because this small provider is experienced in advocating for many services for their kid, you have a built-in social working network with these smaller providers, these, these sort of private in for themselves providers. It, that has been my experience that people go to those big, large DSO services and they are just swamped under the number, numbers as opposed to small local centers where you can go and take your kid, you know? And that is life in, in the big city for, 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 for our families. And, you know, I could go on and on about, I don't want to rag on the DSOs because I met wonderful people there. It wasn't that they weren't full of good people and who are real professionals and who cared. But when you don't meet with your clinician, when the administrators are deciding whether you're in or out, where you don't meet with the family support person, I've been in service for five years now. I have never, ever spoken to the family support service person in the at the DSO, never once, not a single phone call, not even a generic email. I've been never been offered any other kind of service, SLPs, OTs, nothing. You know, so this is what it's like for real for families. So I think it, hearing that kind of story and those things have to change. It's, it's right? a very common story. Wouldn't you, Angela, would you say, think that's a far-fetched story of any kind? No, not at all. Being a mom uh, of a, a child that went to both DSO and DFO as well, um, I pulled my son out of DSO after a few months because I was livid with um, how I was treated, how um, I felt my son was a number as opposed to an individual. I didn't feel they took his individual needs um, mm -hmm. into account. It was, you know, a, like a one size fits all kind of program for a, a you know a three year old with autism. It, 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 and the worst part was there was zero accountability and zero um, transparency. Uh, the way that I left the DSO was I came, he was, my son was crying all the time and I knew something was wrong because he was a happy kid. He, he liked going to people's houses, you know, and he just kept getting progressively um, more sad and physically he started vomiting, you know, uh, and that was unusual for him. So I showed up one day unannounced and I said, I want to see my son and they wouldn't let me in. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't let me in to see my son because they said, you're not allowed in without a senior therapist. And I said, get me a senior therapist. And they said there weren't any available that I would have to wait another hour or two to get my son. And mm -hmm. uh, I said, that's fine. I'm calling the police because if you can't keep me from my child, I never gave you permission. This is considered kidnapping. Mm -hmm. As soon as I mentioned the word police, they, uh, they brought him out to me and I yeah. took 
and, and my experience mirrors mirrors Angela's very much. It mirrors Angela's. So this is why people like us are involved with the OAC because we have experienced the good and the bad and the ugly, both Angela and myself, Laura Kirby McIntosh, Bruce McIntosh, you name it, all of us, we've experienced excellent service and the opposite. Okay, so let's move on, shall we? All right, um, Teresa, you've been on a steep learning curve. Is there anything you'd like to know from the OAC? Is there, is there more information we can send your way? Would you like to hear from more parents? What, what can we do to help you in your work? Well, first, I want to thank you for um, being so open and honest with me when we met. And for Monique, of course, to introducing us as a group, because that was really helpful. But as you said, it's a very uh, it's a steep, leap, a steep learning curve. And for me, I learn best um, when I interact with people and when I hear, you know, the practicality of what the problem is. And then how to try to resolve it, you know, with the tools that I've got through the legislature. So, so what, one of the things that we did, um, you know, when Angela was, was talking about uh, World Autism Day, right, Awareness uh, Day on April 2nd, uh, you know, hearing, uh, and again, this is, uh, you know, just an example of having that conversation and then figuring out, well, how do we, how do, we do this virtually and how do we, you know, really make an impact? Um, so we did some media, which was great, and, and parents that we talked to that were through the group, they were able to tell their stories uh, during that uh, media event. Um, so just to keep learning is excellent for me, and I, I prefer meeting people regularly, right? So if we can have a long-standing scheduled meeting, and then as time goes on, yes, it can be, you know, intervals, right? Um, but I'm happy to continually meet with you and listen to the stories that you just described from a DSO to the DFO and that experience and those kinds of things and, and kind of think, hmm, that shouldn't be happening in a DSO, you know, and, and how, do, how does that get resolved? How do, you know, how do I look at that? So um, just, I think, listening to the people that are, are going through that experience. And I do miss, as I said, you know, I would have loved to have met your children you know, and, um, and you yourself. Will. I'm bringing my son in person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and it gives you a better perspective, right? I mean, I'm older, I, my kids are older, I don't go into the schools, I, you know, I'm, I, my kids, you know, are not autistic, They're, my grandkids aren't. So I haven't had that direct connection, right? So this is my direct line to learning about what your kids experience, what you experience as a community and as families. And so just meeting again I would love to meet with you again um we'll have to reach out Bria's off this week she needs a break <laughs> she's been working so I'll hard bet. I'll bet Bria yeah. and Teresa's we, we have a meeting long, scheduled next week by the way Teresa yes yeah. so yes. ongoing meetings absolutely and <laughs> yes. um and you know and just coming up with new innovative ways during this uh COVID is to get the word out and to uh, you know let people keep it out in the media, right? Because that's where some of that, that pressure comes from that the government gets shamed or embarrassed. Um, I'll, I'll do a kind of a, a plug. I'm going to be introducing uh, the World Autism Awareness Day. Um, I'm hoping this week when I'm in the legislature, uh, we're getting some final pieces on there. Um, so that's, that's going to be something, I think, again, it's education, it's informative, it gives us a day, uh, you know, to, to proclaim if the government passes it, it also outlines the kind of responsibilities and what we want to see uh, for autism families and their children. Um, so it's a good, it's a good bill, it just doesn't say let's just talk about autism and educate, it says this is some of the things we need to commit to, like some of the things we need to be responsible for when it comes to autism, right? Um, so I learned from that conversation that we've never had a World uh, Autism Awareness Day in Ontario. So I'm like, well, you know what, let's do something about that. So, you know, so those, so those, the steep learning curve comes from talking to people and trying to hear what this, what the problems are, the good things too, right? We want to hear the bad, the good and the ugly and, uh, you know, make the good keep developing that, correct the other things so we can get to a place mm -hmm. where the kids have the best outcomes and their best lives, live their best lives. And parents can, you know, breathe easy as they go through their adult years that they're in a good place. 
Mm-hmm. Your your boss has a longstanding relationship with this file, doesn't she? Isn't uh, Andrea had Andrea the file Barbeid? before Monique? That's right. Yeah, yeah. A couple, so yeah, before, you, couple before me. Does that yeah. mean you're going to take over the party, Monique? Is that how it goes? Me? Oh, Is that the I, no, no, we got Andrea. Is that how that goes? No, 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 no. no Don't start that rumor. I have, <laughs> I have, I have my full faith in Andrew Horvath. <laughs> so a little a piece of information. When you're able to come visit me in my office, that was Andrea's office. Okay. Previously. Yeah. So I, I took it over. So France took over from Andrea. I took it over from France. And um, every time we have an election, you know, we put our names in a hat to see who wants to move offices. And I say, no, I'm good. I'm happy where I am. <laughs> so uh, I've been there for it'll be 10 years in October. I haven't moved, don't want to move. Uh, so I'm hoping, you know, from the women that had that office before, I'm just going to, you know, get those good vibes and keep going. Thank well, Monique has quite a spiffy office. Yes. Yes, she does. Teresa, thank you so much. We, we look forward to meeting with you several more, t- more times if you are I willing to meet with the OAC. Uh, we're more than happy, to, as you can see, to share our experiences. Monique, is there anything that you would like to say to our community before you dump us completely? <laughs> Let's just say I will never dump you. I will always be here. I will always be one of your biggest fans and you know, continue to be a champion for you. Uh, but, uh, you know, people grow into adults and, um, and you're, there's so much in the mental health um, and addictions uh, portfolio that overlaps um, and that uh, will keep me uh, very focused on this file. Um, and honestly, I love you all so much uh, because of the last 10 years. No, like it's real. Like I have grown so much with your community um, and uh, I'll, it'll be something I'll tra- cherish for the rest of my life. Um, but I know I'm putting it in good hands. And uh, like I said, I'm, I'm never going far. Uh, my door will always still be open. And um, yeah, just, you know, and I, I, I know that Teresa is going to do a great job on this file. I just, I know that. Well, you know, in our community, transitions are a challenge. Uh, and, uh, and, but we'll, we always get through them. And, uh, you know, on a personal note, Monique, I would like to thank you personally. Uh, I, I, I would like to give you credit for the reason why I jumped into the OAC as much as I did. Uh, during 2016, when it looked like the service for my son was being canceled, I curled up into a ball and I was incapacitated uh, with grief and, and horror stricken that something so cruel would happen. And this woman at Queens Park stood up and got kicked out. And the strength of that, while I know it wasn't, um, you probably don't think of, you probably don't think of that, that was just maybe business of the day. But to hear a strong voice of someone who wasn't living our life, say no, this shall not happen, made me wipe my tears, put on my big girl pants, and jump in. And the OAC had been trying to uh, get me involved and I kept resisting. But uh, uh, I, uh, you are responsible. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. So if anybody has a problem with me, they can take it to Monique. But I, I thank you so much, Monique, for, that, for, for all of your acts and all of the, I know the strong relationships that you have with so many of the mothers in our community and the fathers. Uh, we will miss you. You are missed but we are looking forward to getting to know Teresa. Uh, We are also hoping to get to know some of the people on the other side of the room. Teresa, uh, we are willing and able to work with all politicians, whether they be conservative, liberal, NDP, Green Party, doesn't matter to us just so long as the kids get the help that they need and adults get the help that they need. So Monique, we, you are sorely missed, but we wish you the very best day, Angela. Any last words, Ms. Um, Ms. President? (laughs) Uh, Well, I'd like to echo some of your sentiments uh, with Monique. Of course, um, you know, she's going to be missed as the critic uh, because her voice was so recognizable. And, um, 
you know, when you mentioned, you know, maybe it was business of the day, I always knew it wasn't with Monique. And when Monique was talking earlier um, about meeting with parents and how it was heartbreaking, I can't tell you how many times I saw her cry. Like, we need more politicians that actually care. And I know that Monique is one of them. And mm -hmm. I, know, I know you won't be a critic on the file, but um, you'll always be family to me. And you with me, all of you, all of you, I'll keep you with me always. That's never going away. And, and I, think, I, think, I think the OAC as a whole will consider you family. Yeah, we are, right. we are families. We are absolutely families with the good, the bad, and the ugly. And thank you so much for your time on a Sunday night, Teresa. And, oh, I, can I, can I finish? Yes, please. Oh, you, okay. <laughs> what now, Angela? Well, I wanted to thank Teresa. Come on. Oh, All no, right. No, 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 I want to, and I want to welcome Teresa. And I want to say how open and um, how accommodating and how well she's been listening and, and understanding. And mm -hmm. um, I have absolutely no concern that Teresa is not going to be doing an awesome job. Like I, I, I'm fully convinced that exactly. uh, Teresa- All right, all right. We were this nice to Michael Goteau, by the way, <laughs> just so you know. You were? <laughs> we were, we were this nice. And and just, now just, they're really, the, now the Tories are never gonna talk to us. So like, no, okay. No, no, unless, unless we shame them more, which we may be which doing over the do. next few months, just, Hold on. They create their own journey. They create that journey. Yes, they, they create the relationship. They choose to supply or not to supply. You Absolutely. can't. You can't decide to like them or or not like them when they make all the decisions, right? Yeah, and one and one of the things that I was going to mention about the uh, the private members bill is, you know, Teresa said if the government passes it, I'm almost kind of hoping that they don't. Um, it'll it re reveal uh, how monstrous they really, really are. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens with that. Um, I, I assume it'll be passed. But they can redeem themselves. They can <laughs> redeem themselves. Hope springs eternal. Thank you so true. much, ladies. <laughs> let's call let's call it a night, Angela. Okay, Thank you so everyone. much, ladies. Thank you so we much. have Thank a you. slogan in the OAC: Awareness is nice, action is better. Yeah. 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 Thank Absolutely. you again, ladies. Good night, OAC. Thank you, everyone. Good night, Bye. everybody. Bye. Bye.